Hello, my name is Matt. Welcome to Unbearable 73. This video is several weeks, maybe even like a month or two late. Honestly, it was kind of like pulling teeth. The final episode of Wheel of Prime Season 2 disgusted me more than any other episode of the show. Um, every time I kept sitting down to do this, re this, this review, I was like, no, just no. And it blocked me from doing other videos because I just didn't. Because mentally, I'm like, um, you know, I need to do things in order. And if this is sitting there, I know I can't do other stuff. I mean, you know, so. But it's up. It'll be up. I, I'm not, I couldn't make myself do that, um, like, you know, why, like live reaction type of thing where I edit it down or whatever. I just couldn't stomach editing that file. But, so we'll get the review here. Now, uh, this review, it's going to be slightly different format than my other previous reviews. Uh, like, those were the short and sweet takes on it, so to speak, with some of the points I noticed. Um, since it's been several weeks, I'm focusing on one particular theme in my review. And the thesis for this episode is, is basically, in my opinion, this is a pure character assassination. And by that, I mean that Rafe Dudkins and his team are deliberately trying to destroy the the perception, the positive perception of the character that Robert Jordan wrote. Right? Now, I thought uh, season one, ep the season one episode where they first show Luz there in Telemann, there was a flashback, was the worst episode previously because of the character assassination. Okay? But this episode is a hundred times worse than that. And that's the only, I say, the only possible underlying theme of this is, is that uh, Dutchkins is deliberately trying to subvert the depiction of the characters in Robert Jordan's real time. Right. So basically, I'm going to be focusing on the, the show's main characters for the most part as, and mention how, how they're just systemically worked over by Dutkins. So first, character assassination is a, in a, is a return to making Luz there and tell him and look like possibly the worst human being of his era. Okay? Um, and, and if you remember, recall the beginning, it's a flashback to 3,000 years ago where, and you see Luz there and tell him on and a group of the male Aes sealing Ishmael away in the show's version of the seal used to imprison him. Uh, LTT and Ishmael have a conversation about Ishmael's desire to not be born to what he perceives as an endless cycle of experience of people he cares about dying over and over again. In actual canon, that doesn't happen. Now, we don't know the precise sequence of events. You know, we know Luz Theron uh, had an argument with Mirren over... Uh, Mirren? Um, no, Mirren is uh, uh, Selene uh, slash Lanfear. Uh, with a, 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 a high-ranking female Aes Sedai. And if, basically, the female Aes Sedai and most of the male Aes Sedai don't agree with Luce there in plan, and so he has to take the hundred male companion, companion to a male Aes Sedai, and they go off to Shail Ghul, and they steal the Dark One away, presumably have a big battle with the Forsaken and all that, right? So, in actual canon, reincarnation in Jordan's work is only the soul being reincarnated. It, souls do not retain their prior memories. They're totally divested of all previous memories and burdens of the prior life, so they can live a unique, so they have a unique second chance as it were the only unique soul is that is that of the dragon the pattern only spins the dragon or the soul that we call the dragon out when it's need to face the dark one and the show completely reworks Ishmael's motivations in an attempt to get to the same place yet it fails utterly Ishmael was a great philosopher and theologian he understood more about the will of time and the underlying metaphysical reality than just about anyone of his day he chose to join the dark one not because he wanted power or prestige but rather, he had an underlying nihilistic urge and concluded that the Dark One would inevitably win and he determined that the Dark One would then at some point destroy reality. Therefore, better to get the Dark One side sooner rather than later, rule for a time, and get reality just wiped out to get over with. Yeah. Like all the rest of the Forsaken, Ishmael was imprisoned in the outer layers of the seals that lose their entitlement and 100 companions made. However, we know something didn't work properly with Ishmael, although it's also because he was extremely powerful. He's the only... For there are two male Forsaken who are considered to be on the same tier of power as um, Luz Theron Telemann. Ishmael is one of them. And he, anyway, he remained not only awake and aware for those 3,000 years, but he gained an ability to somehow partially emerge and interact with the world, which he did over several times over the course of 3,000 years. But that, that, that experience basically drove him insane. Right? His nihilistic 
actually took over his thinking. He solely desires to help the Dark One win because he wants uh, to, he wants to, that the Dark One prevents him from ever being reborn again. The show sloppily blends all that together in a very misguided attempt to make Ishmael sympathetic and continues to try to do whatever it can to make Booster and Talamon look like an asshole. So our next character in this assassination is the White Cloaks. Um, now don't get me wrong, in the books the White Cloaks are basically scum. Okay? But they're uh, they're kind of well-intentioned scum. You know, Rotel is paid with good intentions. They think they're serving the light. Um... You know, they're, they're, they, they, they do protect people from bandits and monsters and whatever. But they consider it a lot more monsters than really are. You know? in, in, in this crap show, the, in, there's a battle in, in this episode. The White Cloaks are invading uh, Falm, who's held by the Shan Shan. And the White Cloaks send a wave who has to be hundreds or thousands of children to make a massive smoke cloud to hide their gigantic charge. The smoke cloud is so big, you see it even after the charge, right? It, 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 you know? So, like, they have to be incompetent to base, I mean, you know, but that, that, that mass children fog cloud, smoke cloud thing only worked because of the next character assassination, uh, which is the Sean Chan. Now, again, I hate the Sean Chan. They're like Oculus sandpaper when you read them in the book, to me, in my view, but they're highly efficient, competent, and effective military force. In this episode... They, do, they don't even stage one single Soldam Demane combo at the main gate. The entire White Cloak charge would have been printed if there was one there. Just one there. Okay? Um, so, so, there, there we go. We have group assassinations. Now let's go on to individuals. Well, no, we, well, let's go on to things. They, you know, they, they also character assassinate things. The next target of their assassination is, assassination is the corrupt city of Shiar Logoth and Mashadar. In the books, Shi'ar Logoth was a city whose population was driven to madness and evil by the advice of a man named Mordeth. Interestingly enough, and this is just an aside, I wonder if that's inspired impartially by uh, Sauron's corruption of Numenor via his counseling. Now, consider, Sauron's master was the great dark, dark lord Morgoth, okay? Um, the corrupt advisor, Mordeth, Corrupted the whole city, which is like Sauron did to Numenor, basically, the whole country. So, I, I wonder, we know that Jordan was inspired by Lord of the Rings in many areas. I wonder if that's one of the sort of homages he threw in there. Anyway, so where, where did Dudkins take this? The Mashadar, a corruptive force that is trapped in Shadow of Logoth, who will spread like a zombie plague if you let out of the city. In any way, it's a dangerous, corruptive force. And the dangerous, corruptive force of Mashadar basically turns a dagger into a lightsaber, a fracking lightsaber. Good job, Rafe. Now it gets us to our next Dudkin's demolition, Matt Cawthon. Um, now, you could make a serious argument, and there wouldn't be much debate, that Matt's character has been the most wrecked by this crap show, even more so than Rand's, right? In the novels, Matt went on a risky quest. Excuse me. And one of the rewards he got was the power of Rutsvir, the Asharande, Ashandere, or uh, however you want to pronounce it. This show reduces the Ashandere to a cursed dagger attached to some sort of broom handle, which acts like a combination of lightsaber and poison needle. If this were the dagger from the novels, stabbing people with things with that dagger would literally be spreading Mashadar everywhere. It would be a bigger problem than anything else they're experiencing. The scene where Matt comes up implements the idea to tie the, the dagger to a broom is comically bad. and it should, this should, There should be no comically bad stuff in this show. So let's get to our next character assassination. Loyal. Apparently Masima, Masima, the master of, of hand-to-hand combat, right, has to be the one to explain to Loyal, the book, the the hundred year old a book nerd who's read every book he can find and knows lore falling out of his gigantic gears. Masima has to explain to Loyal what the Horn of Valir is and what it does. In the novels, Loyal knows the Horn of Valir is and what it does. And in fact, I believe he recognized, if I remember correctly, in the previous episode 8 of the previous season. But anyway, um, Loyal in the novel, he's, he's arguably the second most intelligent of the main characters early on, after, say, Moraine. You know? That's one of his roles, is to explain stuff in, in the books. And the show is basically reduced to a gigantic Sasquatch looking slave. He looks a lot like the Sasquatch from Six Million Dollar Man, a show which I love, unfortunately. I would not consider it a proper homage. 
Part of me wants to save the next conversation for last, but since the show doesn't make Rand the main character, I guess I don't have to either. The show has steadily deconstructed Randall for. It keeps taking his signature moments and giving them to others or turning them to shit. One of the pivotal moments where Rand establishes himself as a blade master. It's his duel with High Lord Turok. It's a great scene. Matter of fact, my favorite scene in all the books is in book one. It's it's the time Rand spent getting his father, who was wounded, in 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 the in the winter, from their house to the to Eamon Field. Right. That's my favorite scene in all the books. Right. My favorite scene in book three is just, it's arguably the duel with High Lord Turok. The insight to Rand's thinking, how he had to grow as a combat and all that. Anyway, and this show ruins it. Just when you think there's a huge confrontation goes coming up, someone on Dutch can see like, hey, <laughs> let's subvert their expectations. Uh, you know, and he basically uses the one power to kill Turok and all his guards. Um, Dutkins basically, essentially, cuts off one of Rand's metaphysical testicles here. You know, uh, uh, Jordan, Jordan t- turns Rand into a well-deserved badass on multiple fronts. Through hard work and circumstance, perseverance, helping his allies. Yeah, he has severe in nature, and it gives him luck, too, as well. Right? By the end of this episode, Duncan just transformed Rand into a side character to what seems to be the main character now, Egwene. They even managed to undercut Rand's storyline there. In other words, they, they, not only did they manage to cut, undercut Rand's storyline from the book, which they're largely de- destroying, but they managed to undercut his storyline in their own crap show. Rand went to Falmy to help Aguin, yet when he finds her, it's established he never needed his help. And then finally, the big moment of the book when Rand faces Ishmael in a battle that touches the sky and defeats him, completely subverted. Essentially, if Aguin had uh, the, a sword, there would have no need for any other character in that final confrontation. And now on to Aguin. Uh, you know, in the books, Aguin's time as a demonia is very formative to our psychology. She gains an inner mental trauma and the influence on the decision for the rest of the series one way or another. The show seems to be interpreting that as this experience making a into a borderline, unhinged, hard man for hard times. It makes no sense. Well, no. It makes certain sense um, from the point of view of, you know, the, the, the woke ideology they're using for this show. But it makes no sense from the point of view of their claims to want it to be in a, more of an ensemble than the books were. They also turn Aguin into a cold-blooded killer, something which her experience with the Sarnatron made her the opposite of. She, she, she didn't become a pacifist, but she just she was very reluctant to kill people directly after that. Because she saw the potential for evil and violence that the One Power did. Part of her understood why the Sean Chan seemed to be in, uh, collaring the women, because the power was dangerous. It's why she was insistent upon they take the three old uh, spoilers. When they, get, when they eventually become Felicity and control of the tower, why should we insist upon them taking the three oaths? Why would be, be, man, you know, the, the, to, because the one power is dangerous. Um, it's a great responsibility. As Stanley once wrote, with great power comes great responsibility. And, you know, and also, did they have the demonic where those stupid mouthpieces solely they could have Egwene spit one out in defiance? It seems like the only reason that they were there. On to another destruction. Now, my two favorite characters in the actual Wheel of Time, not, not Wheel of Prime, are Rand and Nynaeve, okay? So if there's two things... We're talking about Nynaeve right now. If there's two things that characterize Nynaeve Almira, which book readers know, um, and that clearly means that neither Rafe nor his writing team do, is that she's devoted to a knowledge of the healing arts, and she has an anger problem, Okay? For the majority of this episode, in fact, most of this series, nothing, I mean, nothing makes her angry. Not being around those who are wounded and dying people, not seeing our friend Elaine taken out to the knee, not seeing Rand severely injured, nothing. Why is that important? Because Nynaeve has a block on her ability to channel. And in the books early on, the only way to overcome that block is to get angry, which will also use the one power. So, of course, it can't let that happen here. But Elaine, uh, Nynaeve in the books knows that. Uh, she knows she has to make herself angry to, to use the power. So she kind of self-manipulates herself. To self, self-manipulates self herself. It's not like I'm saying something naughty and I'm not, but it's, anyway. So, and the other thing they destroy, Nynaeve the healer. This is probably Nynaeve's overwhelming personal characteristic, okay? The wisdom of Emmett and Fields, who has a vast knowledge of practical healing and medicine, which includes herbal techniques, 
setting wounds, cleaning wounds, stitching things, all the stuff you would expect a medieval level hero with a bit of bumped up knowledge would be able to do. That's not Nene even this show. Show Neve has no idea how to heal people. She literally pushes a crossbow bolt completely through Elaine's leg. That, that's the most comically bad thing a supposed master of healing could do in a given situation. And when Rand needs to be healed in the end, it's not Nene that heals him, it's Elaine. So my final thoughts, um, this is a 0 out of 10. This is an atrocious end to an atrocious season of an atrocious show. The only phrase that best describes is the one in my thumbnail, I win again, lose Theron. Thanks again for watching my video. Smash the like button if you liked it. Hit the like if you did. Comment down below if you have any questions for me about this video. Please share this video if you found it worthwhile. I'm Matt. This has been another episode of Rebel 73. Have a nice day and I am out of here.